Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is part one of three of tutorials covering Busoni's transcription of the uh, J.S. Bach Chacon from Violin Partita in D minor, the partita number two, BWV 1004. The original Bach um, partita was written between 1717 and 1720, and Bach states are 1685 to 1750. And then Busoni's dates of <clears throat> when he lived was were 1866 to 1924. The first published version of this came out in 1892. And there were um, subsequent versions. And the final version, which is what we'll be working from today, was published in 1916. I am using the Henley edition, very quality scholarly edition. I highly recommend that everyone uses an Urtex edition whenever studying, um, well, anything in piano. Whenever you can get an Urtex edition, I highly recommend it, but especially with works by Bach, uh, including this transcription by Busoni. Before we get too far into the tutorial, I'll go ahead and just play um, just the main idea, uh, just the first eight bars. It starts on beat two. So uh, this is written in three, four time. Um, so that's always a little bit jarring when someone first hears this. So here you go. bar nine there. Okay, so that's the main idea. A chacon is a composition in a series of varying sections in slow triple time over a short repeated bass theme. So we're going to hear that same rhythmic uh, idea throughout the piece. And <clears throat> it starts with this distinct chord pattern. It kind of has a big three-part structure throughout the chacon. We see um, this distinctive rhythmic profile of a sarabond uh, emphasizing beat two. So starting two and three, and one and two and three, and one and two and three. There's already rhythmic pulling on our heartstrings, on the emotion of the piece, even from the very first beat of the piece, which happens to come on beat two of a measure. Um, we see 33 restatements of this in the minor mode, then 19 in major, and then finally 12 more in minor. So it very loosely has a, a three-part structure. And not to get too philosophical, but this is very representative of the human experience. We, we go through turmoil. Um, the middle part, I think, is basically like a prayer um, we finally after this section here uh, it's just crazy we go. the piece could actually end there but then he goes into the most wonderful part of the piece in my opinion this is my favorite part or one of my favorite parts and we stay in major for a while. And then finally, at the end, we, we have this furious final statement. Um, it goes back to tempo one. It goes to this Pio Vivo. And then finally, we get... The final... St Sorry, that was wrong. Just one of the most glorious pieces of music ever written by Bach. Certainly is a monumental piece in the violin repertoire from what I understand. I don't play violin, so I can't speak to firsthand experience. I watched this wonderful lecture and performance by Joshua Bell on that uh, piece, and he talks about how daunting it is. And this transcription by Busoni, so famous, um, and it is very daunting as well. That's why I'm going to do this 
uh, tutorial in three separate parts because I just there's no way we could get through 20 pages or so of how long this piece is in one hour tutorial. So today's portion of the tutorial, we're going to go through the first 93 bars. Um, so right after this, right after that part, it goes to this tranquilo in uh, 94. Um, gorgeous section. We'll stop there. And just a little note, when I was learning this piece, my wife had a little uh, studio recital and she said, will you play something? And I wasn't going to bore her students with 15 minutes of the Bach Busoni Chaconne. I said, but I want to play some of it because I'm right in the middle of learning it. And so I actually just cut from there um, to the second to last page and then played all the way to the end. That makes a brilliant cut of the piece. If you're in the middle of learning it and want to perform something, that's just a little side note. It's it's not to say you should perform it like that ever. Um, but if you're just doing little practice performances, the piece does divide up very conveniently to perform various sections. So we start out andante maestoso, ma non troppo lento. So uh, moderately slow, majestically, uh, but not too slow. And I'm going to, you know, be a heretic here and start out with something that might offend a lot of people. But I heard in a performance, uh, there are many wonderful performances of this piece, uh, too many to name. A few that are among the most famous, Evgeny Kissin, Elang Rameau, uh, Michelangeli, many amazing, and we even have the piano rolls of uh, Busoni playing this, which that's an interesting recording. Um, I have my own thoughts on it, but of course we have to listen to the person who um, transcribed the piece originally. Uh, quite astonishing to be able to hear him play, even if it's on piano rolls. Um, but I heard Sergei Babayan play this in Michigan as part of the Gilmore Festival. And he was almost double dotting this first part. So Sony himself in his piano roll recording is almost double dotting this part. So he doesn't do it at the beginning, but you go. So what, you don't have to double dot it, but what I want to instill in everyone listening to this tutorial is to have a forward momentum. Do not stagnate and make your short values short or uh, longer. That's immediately going to put us on the back of our seats and kind of lagging. We always want to be at the front of that beat. So... Almost delayed. And you can, Andante Maestoso, you can interpret that many different ways. I've heard it very slow. And I've, I've heard others, uh, Bob Ayan himself was quite fast. Regardless of what you choose, I just wanted to start with that little piece of um, maybe controversial advice about almost double dotting, just to demonstrate that it should have this forward drive in there. It is not, just by the nature of the D minor in the bass, full of angst, we want to convey these emotions right off uh, the bat, right, right at the beginning of the piece. Busoni was very true to Bach's score. Some transcriptions you listen to, you're like, wow, they took a lot of liberties in that. This is not one of them. He takes a few things, he adds a few little details um, in just a few small spots uh, because 
he really stressed uh, on the reading I did, the research previous to this video, he was very adamant about <laughs> the person he actually dedicated it to um, was critical of it. He said, oh, this basically should have been left as a violin piece. And Busoni said, music should never, basically he, in, in a nutshell, said music should never be constrained to one sound, basically. And by playing it on the piano, he was able to expound many of the um, limitations of the violin. Now, all you violinists out there, don't hate me for saying that. I'm just saying we've got 10 fingers and we've got this huge keyboard to play. We have a little, and uh, huge registers too. We have different uh, advantages um, with this giant instrument versus what is capable on a violin. And I'm not knocking the violin piece whatsoever. It is gorgeous in its original form. But Busoni was very adamant, and he was not only just thinking pianistically, but he was thinking orchestrally. Uh, on that uh, major section, I know I'm talking quite a bit. This is such a monumental piece and tutorial. I wanted to start with a proper introduction on, see, my music's falling apart. That's a good, good sign if your music's falling apart. It means you've practiced. Okay, so here... He says, quasi tromboni. So like a trombone, and, and it really does sound like it. So I want you to think orchestrally as you make your way through this piece. Okay, I think I've exhausted the introduction. Here we go. Let's just start with uh, how I divided this in my hands. So Marc-Andre Hamlin um, has a few suggestions in here. Uh, he would just divide it right there. But I actually like to take all the melody in the right hand. It gives me a equality. In the shaping to not be going, okay, I got a voice in my left hand perfectly. And then it's got to transfer to the right hand. Doing it all in one hand has helped me. I don't think anyone would be offended by doing that. It is a transcription after all. So I would just take those two and this. You can use whatever fingering you want, by the way. I use a, a thumb there and then five, three there. Here we go. So be thinking and you're counting in your mind. I'm just going to do standard uh Rhythm. I'm not going to do the double dotting that I referred to right now. So, two and three, and one and two and three. You might want to switch to a three on this so you can connect it into the F. And one and two and three. Okay, now here you've got a couple of options. Some people will cross. And then go to that. I always just did a, a, a simpler... I'm right here, so I just did four and then three one, two one, and then, and one thing that Bob Ayan also did that I just loved is he went and created a lot of momentum that way, he even rolled this. Definitely hearkening to the practices on the violin. So on violin, However they do that, um, it, a quadruple stop there. <laughs> so um, dividing it. I don't think there is anything wrong with doing that. And that also taking a little time and then recrescendoing to there and then recrescendo to there. Now, I've been yelled at by every one of my teachers endlessly for getting too cute and gentle on big places. So my instinct is to go and then soften that, just that, you know. Of course, this is still the dominant. Um, some people will drive to there, and that's totally fine too. What I don't want you to do is Think of these as completely equal. So either drive to beat two or 
emphasize it by just the tiniest bit of time like I just did. I, I like the time inflection. And I like that B flat major. This is such a gorgeous chord. I like to voice that top out, soften that left hand just a little bit to provide a timbre change, a tone color change. And then I will be big again. Okay, now with pedaling, I've you can look at the pedal cam, what I've been doing. But right here, and I would probably suggest changing on that single D because he does write a an eighth rest in the left hand there. So change, change, change. And what I do there is I hold those through because they're half notes. I do four, three, five. So I'm still holding this chord. Do not make the silly mistake I've seen students do in other pieces where they go. Or they'll just pedal. That sounds terrible. So, so pedal off and then back down. So it's just a long delayed change. Now here, it can be tempting to allow that to resolve. Because it's, it's an elided cadence. It's, it's finishing that one and it's starting the next uh, phrase. I like to start with a bang there. So... Okay, because Busoni writes, forte, sempre molto energetic, en energico. So, um, always loud with a lot of energy. So... Now, this part is a little bit tricky.